Hi, welcome to the uh, video about your historical introduction to our textbook. Um, you know, one of the difficult things about teaching any kind of survey course is trying to fit in everything that takes place in the time span that the course, you know, sets as its parameters. Um, because you, there's just no way, right? So that's one thing. Another thing that's very challenging with American Lit in particular is that, you know, what is American literature? Um, the book starts out 1492-ish, right? Columbus. But Columbus never set foot in America, right? Um, there are quite a lot of readings um, that are by explorers from Spain and, and all that. They are in Mexico, they're in the Caribbean, they're in South America. And yet, is that really American literature, right? Um, so last year I asked my class where they think the class should start. I asked them at the very end of the semester after we did everything, and they all agreed that it really should start with Native American literature and colonial literature, but definitely should be people who've actually stepped foot in America, because there is a difference between American literature and literature of the Americas, which would include North America, Central America, South America, and the Caribbean, right? So because of that, we're not going to be reading um, any literature that is by people who did not actually come to America. So no Columbus, no Bartolomeo de las Casas. That doesn't mean that you can't read it, that it's not interesting. And that doesn't mean that I won't sometimes mention certain things because there was an impact on America of what was going on in Mexico and Jamaica and, and uh, all of the Caribbean islands, right? Especially with the rise of slavery. Um, and, and again, as these people that were in those areas were telling stories and sending them back to Europe, that increased the thirst to come to the New World. But we're not going to be reading any of those texts in the book. Um, so just kind of, that's a couple things I wanted you to, to realize about some of the choices I'm going to be making. Um, one of the ongoing themes we have in this class is what does it mean to be an American? And what does it mean when we say American literature? And this first part of this semester, until we get to probably the 18, early 1800s, mid 1800s, um, we're not really gonna see fiction a lot. We do have a few poems that we're going to read. And we do have some Native American oral literature that's been written down that would qualify as um, maybe not necessarily fiction, but more narrative and stories, right? But a lot of the literature in the first part of the colonial period um, up to and including, I think, the early national period, which generally goes to about 1828 when Andrew Jackson becomes uh, president. But a lot of that literature is mainly nonfiction. Uh, we're going to see, I think, um, some broad categories of literature in this class. You're, you are gonna have fiction. We're going to see poetry. We do have um, Roger Williams and Ann Bradstreet, Phyllis Wheatley. We're, we're gonna be reading their poetry. Um, and then we're definitely going to get into short stories when we get to Washington Irving and then proceed on to Hawthorne and Poe. We are going to see novels. Uh, we're not going to read any novels in this class, but we are going to read uh, Bartleby the Scrivener by Melville, which is considered a novella, right? Or a really long short story, one of the two, right? Um, but we really aren't going to see things that we would recognize as fiction until a little bit later in the semester. So there's one category, fiction. But as we look at that category, we're going to see that the earliest forms of literature that we see in this class are really just mimicking what's going on in Great Britain, right? When you read Anne Bradstreet's poetry, if you've ever studied early uh, British literature around the, you know, the Elizabethan uh, uh, period and the, and the first Stuart period, um, it, the poems are gonna sound a lot like those poetry poems, right? They're going to have the same kind of format, the same tropes, the same use of language. If anything is different in them, we're going to see that maybe the topics that Americans choose to write about are different. Um, you know, American literature, especially in this early era, tends to be focused on religion and family. And then as we get closer and closer to the Revolutionary War, 
we're going to see more and more patriotic literature. Um, but we don't see the kind of saucy, seductive kind of romantic uh, topics that we would in Britain at the same time period. So they're kind of copying the style, they're copying the forms, but the topics are different, right? And, um, and, and then as we get into closer and closer to what we call the American Renaissance, where writers start really asking themselves, well, how are we different from British literature? We share the same language, right? But are we the same? And this is where we first really start seeing um, a real sense of American versus English literature. Another broad category of literature that, that we're going to be looking at that is going to be much more common in the first part is civic literature, right? So these can be things like uh, political tracts, uh, obviously, as we get closer and closer to 17, uh, the 60s and all that, we're going to see much more uh, writing being done about liberty and equality and justice and, and that kind of thing. And we are going to see uh, works by like people like Franklin and de Crevecourt that actually talk about what does it mean to be American. And they really tie this with the sense of exploration and hard work and all that. So. We see tracks that are political, but also civic in terms of, um, you know, how are we gonna run our town, right? Now, those oftentimes overlap in the earliest literature with another category, and that is religious writing. Much of what we're gonna be reading the first part of the semester is very much heavily religious, especially in the English uh, tracts, Puritan and Pilgrim. And then even our Native American uh, selections, we're also going to see many stories that have to do with creationism and Native American religions. Um, so that's another broad category of writing. And the last category is adventure stories and biographies. Uh, and that's, again, is going to be very, very popular in these early sections. And then as we get closer and closer to that American Renaissance, we're gonna find more writing that is kind of fictionalized as opposed to here is my adventure, you know, sailing up the Hudson River kind of stuff, right? So we can see things like by John Smith, uh, William Bradford's Plymouth Plantation is considered kind of a memoir slash travel adventure. So it's about discovering the new world. It's about you know, what did they encounter? And most of these were published in Europe. They weren't published here in America, right? We didn't really have a publishing mechanism at the time, but they were very popular in America. And it, they really did spur on a lot of immigration because people were seeing these stories about this beautiful land, the opportunities, the wealth, right? Um, and they wanted a fresh start or they wanted, you know, a chance to escape something or to create something, right? Now we're going to start seeing some literature that says, hey, don't come here unless you want to work hard. That's one of uh, Benjamin Franklin's letters, right, about being an American. He said, you know, don't come over here and expect that everything's just going to be like falling into your lap, right? Uh, again, the early literature uh, of those travel stories, the adventure stories, we have to take with a grain of salt because, you know, we read John Smith's encounters. We have to think about who John Smith was. He was an adventurer. His job was to, you know, be hired by these groups of people who were coming to the new world and needed a scout or a guide or something like that. So obviously when he's writing about his adventures, he's going to maybe make himself seem very, very competent or brave and things like that. So who knows what really happened? Um, so maybe some of those are much more fiction. Maybe those are really more like short stories than they are nonfiction. It's, it's an interesting line that we're not sure of. Um, and then of course we have a lot of autobiographical literature, uh, people writing about themselves or about other important people in the time. So um, again, you probably started this class thinking it's gonna be poetry and short story and plays and all that, right? Nope, we're not gonna get to a lot of that stuff till about, uh, maybe midterm or a little bit later. So what I've got in front of you on the screen is um, kind of just uh, a nice overview
of things that were in the text. And again, some of these things are not going to necessarily be important for our class, like when I talk about Columbus, but I, I do want to talk about them because I think they set up um, an understanding of what's going on and, and things that did spread to the mainland. The first thing the book talks about is, is a sense of discovery, right? That that people who came to the to the new world, uh, you know, everything was new. There were no rules. They didn't really know what to expect, what they were doing. Of course, they even didn't get to the place they were thinking about, right? Columbus was trying to find a quicker route to the Indies, right, for trade. And boom, there was the huge American continent, right, in the middle of the ocean, right? So that's what we call the West Indies, the West Indies, right? Uh, East Indies, that's India, right? Um, and so, you know, they didn't even know what to expect. And they found so much that was amazing. I, I think that we really don't appreciate how amazing America is. That, you know, the, the physical wonders of our world, right? Just that you can find every single kind of biological kind of atmosphere in America, if you will, right? We've got snow, we've got volcanoes, we've got the Grand Canyon, we've got tropics, right? Uh, maybe not to the extremes that we would see, like if you go up to you know, Canada or if you go south, but we do have all of those different features. We have, you know, all of the forests, right? Um, one of the reasons that Europe was in such trouble during the time when people were find, wanting to come to new places is that they had kind of deforested themselves, right? That people, the population was growing so fast, they were cutting down trees to build homes. Uh, and so they were running out of forests and they were also running out of arable land to farm. And so they were looking for new places to, to find resources that they were running out of, right? And so they come to the new world and the forests are so lush and plentiful that many of these people have never seen forests like this, right? And certainly the redwoods in California, once they started getting that far out, you know, wow, there's nothing like that that I'm aware of in Europe, right? And so, and it may be the cedars or something like in the Middle East at one point, but again, they had cut down so many trees and everything like that, that they had no concept of what a lush forest would look like, right? So there is this sense of wonder and discovery and excitement. Your book does say that early on, this discovery kind of thing was mutual between the Europe's, Europeans and indigenous peoples. But unfortunately, uh, that didn't really last too long. Um, that, you know, at first, you know, especially like with the pilgrims and the Puritans, they got along with those neighboring tribes. But then as more Europeans came over and settled, um, the natives, they, they weren't so willing to give up their lands for these people, right? They weren't so willing to share because all of a sudden it's like, well, there's so many of them, right? Um, and the Europeans, they weren't willing to, to take no for an answer, right? Um, and when we get to, when we see them coming to the islands and things like that, again, um, these people are coming over here looking for wealth. They're looking for commodities to trade, whether that be produce or jewels and metals, or whether it be slaves, you know, people. Um, and so we do start seeing clashes as natives are saying no, you know, and the Europeans weren't willing to listen to that. So we start seeing skirmishes, wars. We also have the devastation of disease that ends up wiping out some native tribes, especially in the Caribbean, in the first part of this exploration. Um, but even when we get to the mainland, there are many tribes uh, who, you know, lose 50% of their population in quite a, a quick turnaround. Uh, in part because of disease, but also because of war. Uh, and then there's even despair. We have quite a lot of accounts of many natives killing themselves out of despair as they just figure that there's no way that they can overcome these Europeans with their guns and their sheer numbers, right? 
Um, but again, at the beginning, there was opportunities for peaceful interaction. And in fact, the, the pilgrims would not have survived that first winter had it not been for uh, the kindness of the native tribes, right? The native groups in that area. Um, the book talks about, or the, you can see here, this idea of the new world wasn't just a matter of, of geography, but it was also about just a whole new social environment. Um, and again, that isn't just about interacting with the indigenous peoples that are already here, but as, as more and more of these settlers, these people come over here from all different parts of Europe, right? All of a sudden they're having to live together. You have, um, uh, an incredible array of languages, of culture, of religious differences. And, you know, as these groups grow and grow and they start butting up against each other, it's like, well, how are we going to learn to live with each other? And so there's that. There is also the issue of many of these groups that came over were charters, right? That they were colonists funded by a, a company, right? Or the government. And then they were they were coming over here to settle, but they had to pay off the loan that they got from the king or whatever investors they had. Uh, and so they were really like businesses. And one of the things that we see happening is that the gap, you know, the distance between the new world and the old world meant that when these settlements had problems, and they couldn't resolve them themselves, they would have to send off letters to the old world and say, you know, what are we supposed to do? And by the time the answer came back, the problem had already been kind of solved one way or the other. Uh, mutiny was a big problem, right? Um, they're, they're, you know, the people in charge were not on hand for the most part. And that meant that when things got tough, right, when food ran out, when disease uh, or the weather, you know, really hit the population hard, uh, and many of maybe the leaders died, uh, you know, you had opportunists spring up. Um, or you had people who maybe were on the lower level of the pecking order and weren't so willing to be that way when they saw all of the opportunities that they had. They wanted, you know, they had like little coups, right? We're going to take over. Um, and so because of that, you see a breakdown in maybe that hierarchy, right? Where, no, we can't do anything until the king tells us or the boss tells us, right? A lot of these people just had to figure it out because it was a necessity. They couldn't wait for the letters to get back to them because it might take six months to a year or more for them to hear. Because once they sent the problem back over to Europe, then the company had to figure out what to do and they might not be in agreement. So they might be bickering back and forth. Right. And so, you know, maybe one of the reasons why there is such a spirit of independence and kind of figured out yourself, you know, to a lot of the, to the American identity is because they really were isolated and they, they had to break some of those older traditional patterns of hierarchy and, and control. Right. Um, Again, so I, I'm going to load this up. So you, I, actually, I think I've already loaded it up. So you can kind of read some more of the details if you want. Um, I think I've kind of covered some of this stuff. Um, the one thing I do want to say before we move to the Native American section is about slavery. So one of the one of the problems with the decimation of native population in terms of like in the Caribbean, right? Where Columbus and all that, they're sailing there. Um, and all of a sudden the natives are either dying out because of disease or war, or they're killing themselves. All of a sudden they, there aren't enough native peoples to do the labor that the Europeans want from them. And so this is where they start importing slaves from Africa to fill in. So that's why you have so many, um, layers of African culture in the Caribbean and then ultimately obviously in America is, you know, they were not native to Jamaica and Haiti and all that, right? They came over here because uh, mainly Spain needed slave labor, right? And so we see a buildup of um, the slave trade 
because in part Native Americans are, or the Native tribes are just disappearing, right? Um, they do say um, in this last bullet point that we can't, at least in the early part here, uh, stereotype all relationships between Europeans and Native populations as victims of, you know, the, the invaders or as negative. Many uh, tribes, um, like Powhatan, when we were reading Powhatan's speech, they initially make alliances, either with France or with Spain or with England, right? They choose. Um, and they trade whatever they have, right? Sometimes it's knowledge, how to plant, you know, in this new environment, right? Uh, they trade knowledge for things like copper kettles, uh, guns, and things like that. Uh, and they become, you know, quite, they, some of them become quite wealthy, the tribes do, for a while at least, right? Now, unfortunately, you know, Europeans just keep coming over and over and over, and pretty soon they want all that land. But there are, you know, many instances where there are positive alliances between these groups. Um, and there are voices that are writing at this time that are, you know, saying things like, you know, it's not right that we're coming over here and just taking this land, or it's not right that we're enslaving these people. We kind of think that that's a more modern kind of sensibility, but even back here in the 1400s, the 1500s, we do have people that recognize that this is wrong, that it is completely not Christian, because again, a lot of these people coming over here were, were seeking religious freedom. Um, Roger Williams is one of the big voices um, of, for you know treating natives uh, as equals, right? Um, and so again, we, we have to be careful that we don't stereotype. So we think about Native American literature, it is oral, right? As all early literatures are. Um, and so uh, the thing is that most of the tribes in the North American section, you know, north of Mexico, were, did not have written alphabets, right? We do know that like the Aztec and the Inca, and the, uh, not the Inca, but the Mayan had codexes, right? The Mayan is oftentimes pictographic, but we do have stuff that, you know, that wasn't destroyed by the church, you know. Incans weren't. I mean, they were completely, never had a written language. But uh, none, for I think we know of that none of the Native American tribes in what we now know as America had written language, so they just have oral traditions. And I say just only as a, as a modifier, not as a, uh, an indication that that was lesser of some kind. Because as your book says, when we look at the ancient traditions of classical literature, going back to the Greeks, right? All literature begins with oral literature, poetry, epic, rhetoric, right? It all starts in the oral tradition. And in fact, if you study classical uh, writing, right? Actually, it's not even writing. Um, you know, speech came first. And then as more people became literate and as the tools to write became more prevalent, if you will, then you have a rise in written language. And it isn't until like, I think the 1300s in Europe when we split speech from writing, right? So now you take two different courses, uh, whereas before you would take a class in rhetoric and you would learn oral as well as written skills, right? Now we separate it because well, the two the two groups had a fight about who was more important, writing, written language, or oral, right? Um, but again, with Native Americans, we can see a lot of very similar kinds of storytellings, uh, serving several kinds of oral literature that we would see in uh, other places in the world. Um, the the one of the problems is that. When we look at Greek literature, ultimately Greeks are the ones who wrote down their own oral literature, right? Um, with the Native Americans, we find that the first things that are oftentimes finally written down are written down in English, not in the native language that they were origi originated from. And they're oftentimes written down by white men. Um, now, that isn't always 100% true. Sometimes we see uh, natives who have been schooled in English, that they start writing down their own stories. But we're still looking at stories that are translated, 
from the native language into English. And if you've ever taken a foreign language, even when we're looking at modern foreign languages, um, there are still some words that don't translate 100% into another language, right? Because they have kind of um, an abstract nature to them that's part of the culture or the time that they're used, right? Um, so we have to realize that when we're reading the speech by King Philip or Powhatan, right, they didn't write that down themselves. This is somebody else who's writing it down, right? Um, when we look at the, the creation story, right, that is someone who wrote it down, you know, hundreds of years after it was originated, right? Um, the book does talk about, again, that, you know, Native American culture or indigenous culture is not monolithic, right? It is incredibly varied. Their religious beliefs are varied. Their story traditions are varied. We have a sampling of, uh, of something from the Winnebago, from the Lenape, from the Cherokee, from the Iroquois, uh, from Powhatan. Um, so we do have samplings from that, but again, it's much richer than what we, we have time to actually look at. Um, let me go to the next page here. Um, so again, this isn't an issue just with Native American literature. It's an issue no matter where you study, when you're looking at oral traditions. If you take Brit Lit One and we read Beowulf, that's one of the really interesting conflicts that we look at in Beowulf. The story takes place around 500 AD in Denmark. <laughs> it's written down around 900 AD, 400 to 500 years after the events of the story by an Irish monk. And the people in Beowulf are pagans, and the narrator tells us that. And yet, at some points, we have the characters in the story saying things like, praise Jesus for saving us, right? And it's like, well, wait a second. Just on the previous page, you told me that these people didn't know who Jesus was. And now, you know, so we have this Irish monk inserting his religious beliefs into that. And there are reasons why. Take Brit Lit One if you want to know that, right? So this isn't just an, an issue of appropriation of Native American culture and, and all that. It is a problem for all uh, literatures when we look at this line where oral literature, you know, starts fading away because we have written literature and people want to preserve those oral stories so they start writing them down. Well, who's writing them down? How well do they understand the culture and the language that they're looking at, right? And how well can they put that into a written form, right? Um, if you study world lit, um, one, when we study Greek tragedy, you know, sometimes you'll be reading a Greek play and the character will say something like, and it'll be written down, Wai! or something like that, right? And it kind of looks weird. But we know that in Greek culture, there were certain sounds of mourning or woe that people would say. It's kind of like if I went, right? We know the wolf whistle because we know those tones and in that pace and in that sequencing, you know what that is, right? So we don't know what those things sounded like, right? Because they didn't have a recorder, they could tape it. Um, and so again, that's one of the problems here. What have we lost in translation, right? Thank goodness that we have anything, right? That we've preserved that. Right? But this is gonna be something we, we visit as we go through. So um, in the Voyage of Discovery, they're just talking about the layers here of, uh, of, the, uh, of the, the groups coming over here, right? We know that by the 1500s, the 16th century, we can't even track how many groups are coming over here by that time, right? Um, it is a very tenuous um, life. When we look at the readings by Anne Bradstreet and Mary Rowlandson especially, um, and, and maybe Bradford, um, we're going to see just how dangerous these existences were, especially if they lived closer to the frontier where they were very vulnerable. They didn't, they didn't live within city walls or very close to large groups of people that could protect them. They were really kind of out there on their own. And, uh, you know, they could be overrun by not just natives, right, but maybe Spain, you know, you're an English settlement and all of a sudden 
well, England and France are at war. And so now you're vulnerable to not only maybe the natives that are out there that don't want you there because you're squatting on their land, but also now the French are out there trying to get you out of there because you're trying to invade what they have claimed for France, right? So again, it's it's a, it can be very sobering reading some of these readings because of the devastating loss that these people face. Um, so just warning you. Um, here are the literary consequences of 1492. This is where I kind of mentioned before uh, the, the printing presses of Europe, printing all of these travel logs, these adventure stories, you know, really sparked this thirst for people to come over here, right? I mean, if you think about Europe, it is a very strong caste system for the most part, right? You have the aristocracy, you have the church, then you have kind of the serfs. And after, you know, the Black Death in the late 1300s, there is some social mobility because a third to half of all Europe was wiped out by the Black Death and the plague. And there had to be people who replaced those people lost. So people did get to maybe escape their bonds, but pretty much, you know, who your dad was, that's, that's who you had to be, right? If your great, 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 great grandfather was a farmer, then guess what? You had to be a farmer. It was really hard to break out of that social structure. There is very hard to lift yourself up to the next class, right? Um, and so America offered a place where you could go and define who you were, right? So those stories, you know, are speaking to people who want that. Now, a lot of these people came over here as indentured servants, and most indentured servants never paid off their servitude. Um, they oftentimes died before they could, right? So unfortunately, there was a lot of people that came over and they never were able to live that dream of freedom, but Pliny did too, right? Um, let me see. Yeah, okay, we've already talked about that. Okay, so Pilgrim and Puritan. So a lot of the readings that we're going to read here um, after we get through with that first Native American section is going to be Pilgrim and Puritan writings of one of the two, right? And so it's important to understand that these are not the same. They are very different. Um, Pilgrims are the group that we think about that came over on the Mayflower. Um, they didn't call themselves pilgrims. They, they called themselves, I think, the forefathers or the first settlers. Um, we could call them separatists, right? So this is a smaller group. Puritans were much larger. So the pilgrims are a very small group. Um, they are, you know, in England. And after the Protestant Reformation, they're quite upset. And, and the same thing is true for the Puritans as well, because they, they both spring from the same problem. They thought that after the Protestant revolution, revelation, um, Reformation, I'll get the word right, um, they really kind of expected that all aspects of the Roman Catholic Church, the gaudiness, the, the ritual, all that, would be out of the Anglican Church. And what we really find is that it, at least at the beginning, the, really the only major difference between the Anglican and the Roman Catholic Church is that now the king is head of the church, not the pope. And Anglican ministers can vary, maybe, but a lot of the same, you know, fancy accoutrement uh, and all of that still were there. And so pilgrims and the Puritans didn't want that. They wanted the church to look much more like what Jesus said in the Bible. And it wasn't about the church building up all of this wealth and all of that, right? The difference is that the pilgrims wanted to separate themselves completely from the Anglican church and start their own church. That's why they're called separatists, right? And at this time, that would be considered treason, right? The Puritans, they wanted to purify the church from within it. They did not want to leave the church. They just wanted to clean it up and stay there, right? So that is... A big distinction. The Puritans were much more persecuted than, I mean, the pilgrims were much more persecuted than pilgrims because they were primarily were poorer and they, they did want to just totally break off things. Uh, and so they were considered more dangerous and, and they were persecuted. 
and they flee to the Netherlands, and they're there for about a year or two, um, and, you know, they're doing okay. They're having some problems because they're having to learn new trades because whatever they learned to do in England, they couldn't do it in the Netherlands because maybe those positions were locked out. They, they weren't allowed to take those positions. They learn how to farm. They learn how to do a lot of textile work, like creating fabrics and, and that kind of stuff. And so they're, they're kind of upset because they don't have the, the economic opportunities that they would like. But perhaps the biggest thing they're worried about is that their children are slowly kind of being assimilated into the Dutch culture. And even though the Dutch are Protestant, it's not the, the more hardcore pilgrim, right? And so this is where they decide that they're going to move to America. And they petition uh, to be given a charter to start their own colony. And eventually after a year, they're given that uh, approval. So they get on board the Mayflower and they sail over. Now, one thing people don't realize is that only about one third of the people on the Mayflower were actually pilgrims. About two thirds of them were just people looking for opportunities, right? So they were secular. And so we do have some problems once we get to the colonies in, or, or the America and they set up their, their colonies because the pilgrims are outnumbered, right? But as they're making their way there, there's a storm that blows. They're supposed to land in Virginia, but the storm blows them up and they land in Plymouth, right? Um, and they just decide to stay there. Um, and unfortunately, it's, it's, they call that the starving time, that first year, because they land in winter. And at the time Europe was going through what, the, or the, America, the world was going through what they call a second ice age. The, uh, the temperatures were about two to three degrees colder. And at, at the point where they were at in the winter, those two to three degrees meant the difference between being able to grow viable crops and not being able to grow crops. And so they were starving. And it wasn't until Massasoit, uh, I think he was a Wampanoag uh, chieftain, saw them, uh, they made friends with them, they taught them how to farm, but we have the first Thanksgiving, right? The Puritans called this, they didn't, I mean, the pilgrims didn't call it the Thanksgiving, right? But what we would consider Thanksgiving was basically the tribe bringing in food uh, and sharing it with the pilgrims. Um, and so that's the pilgrims, right? The Puritans usually considered higher class. So you're going to have a much wealthier group of people. They're usually considered, uh, the, historically, they're more uh, higher educated because they're wealthier than the pilgrims. And again, they don't want to separate themselves from it. But they basically, you know, see an opportunity to go to the New World, Massachusetts Bay is the, the big one here, and start over. So they get a charter from the king, and they come over and they establish Massachusetts Bay, Salem, right, Boston. Uh, John Winthrop is kind of the leader of this colony, and they're a much larger group, right? Um, the two groups eventually do merge about 1691, mainly because the pilgrims are so, they're just dying out, right? And so they are pretty close uh, with their beliefs. The pilgrims are a little bit more snootier, if you will. They consider themselves more holier than the Puritans because they figure the Puritans weren't willing to cut off all ties. But their basic ideas are the same. So they believe in Calvin's doctrine of election, and that means that there are only a certain number of people who God has chosen to save. And you don't know who those people are. So you have to live your life according to God's principles because that's the right thing to do. But you don't know if you're part of the elect or not, right? Um, they also believed that, you know, humans are sinful and, and open to temptation. And so you have to be very careful and live a very, you know, good life and all of that. Um, but as the book talks about, um, we have a, a real skewed stereotype of pilgrims and Puritans of being just real like they never smile and they always wear black and white and all that. None of that's really true. They actually did see joy. Um, and in fact, when we read Jonathan Edwards' sermon, now he's a, a Puritan in the Great Awakening, but there's a, a real focus on finding joy that Christ is 
is um, benevolent and that we should praise him and that we should find joy in the world around us, joy in his sacrifices and his grace and that kind of thing, right? So they are very strict, but that doesn't mean that they're dour, if that makes any sense. And again, you can see some of the other um, distinctions between Puritans and Pilgrims in some of the readings. Um, it is important to note that at this point, these are theocracies, that there is no distinction between the civic world and the religious world, that the people who are the magistrates, the leaders of the society are also generally the religious leaders, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, and this next section is just about, again, I've already mentioned this, that, um, you know, America still doesn't have an official language. The founding fathers never wanted to designate any language as the official language because they wanted this to be a place where people could come and still be who they are, right? Same thing with religion, right? Freedom of religion. Though most, you know, the English colonies kind of win the the conquering wars, right? Spain and France uh, don't stay very long. The English overpower them. And so because most of the, the people that thrive over here are English, English becomes the more common language, right? Um, here, by uh, about 1700, we start seeing, uh, 1696 to 1700, we start seeing printing presses uh, show up in the colonies. Uh, it says here about 250 separate texts were issued by North American printing presses between 1796 and 17, 1696 and 1700. So it's like four years. That, that's a lot of stuff, right? Uh, and what we see is the rise of the printing press, you know, is really important to the revolution, right? Um, to uh, creating a sense of, of a more of a, an American identity as a, not necessarily a country at this point, but you're communicating on paper, right? And that's that's an important kind of glue that, that puts all of this together. So from 1700 to 1820, um, we're, we're going to see a shift in focus because this is where we see the rise of what we call the Enlightenment era or the Age of Reason, right? And this is where more and more people are turning or, or discovering scientific principles. Um, and so you start seeing a clash between those who view the world through religion only, right? Uh, and those who are viewing the world more through reason. And your book does say though that it wasn't an either or, that we did have figures like Sir Isaac Newton who believed that you could do both that just because you look for reason and rational patterns and the scientific you know, understanding of the world does not necessarily mean that God isn't present there. God created reason. God created science. He created the world that runs on these scientific principles, right? Um, and so here it says, the 18th century was characterized by a new conviction that the human mind could comprehend and sometimes control the physical universe and that sympathy and fellow feeling rather than supernatural grace was the basis of moral life. So we start seeing again that just feeling sorry for people, right? Having empathy with others is, you know, the, the basis of morality and not any particular religion, right? And so this is enlightenment. Right. Um, so this, the founding fathers were greatly influenced by many Enlightenment thinkers like Locke and Rousseau. Um, and so this is going to kind of start driving the need for independence. Right. Um, the, the, the bulletin points again emphasize how slavery is growing. Right. Um, and this brings its own clashes. I, I, you know, I've talked about that. You have people speaking out against slavery, even from the very beginning. Right. We're seeing more and more Native American communities at this time um, either being forced off the land. Right. We don't see the Indian removal officially until Andrew Jackson's presidency. Uh, that begins with 1828. 
Um, but that doesn't mean that there wasn't still this effort to get the land and push these tribes, you know, more north or more west, right? Um, and so we're seeing more and more clashes um, and outright hostilities, right? So Enlightenment ideals, uh, again, trying to reconcile philosophical and scientific convictions, convictions with the belief in God. Uh, we see the rise of deism. That basically means that there is a God and he has set everything in motion, but that he is not necessarily acting in the world in direct and explicit ways. That instead he has given us minds that are able to reason and to create, and it is our job to apply his principles to our lives, right? Um, and so again, uh, we can understand that by looking at the concrete world, not just focusing on abstract, you know, things that we can't see. Uh, most of the founding fathers, many of them were deists, right? They were looking for the rational, right? Um, another thing that is a distinction between this era and what era came before is that pilgrims and Puritans tend to believe that humans are inherently sinful, right? That doesn't mean that we can't do better, right? But enlightenment believes more in the glass half full, if you will, that it focuses on um, the inherent good in people. And so you have things like the social contract being discussed, like, you know, what is the agreement that people have when they live together in society? And some people say, you don't need a lot of laws because human nature is going to always bend towards doing what's right. But then you have other people say, well, yeah, but we still need laws because that gives people clear choices, right? But again, that's one of those distinctions. Now, part of what happens in reaction to the Enlightenment is what we call the Great Awakening. And it's one of the first uh, religious uh, movements that we see. Uh, we're going to see several awakenings happen in American history. Um, I'm not sure that we see another one in this class. That's kind of more American lit too. Um, but in about 1730, we start seeing, um, you know, people who are primarily pilgrim or Puritan, Puritan by this time, kind of reacting against this science and philosophy, this way of kind of thinking that you can reason your soul, right? And so this is the Great Awakening where we see um, this movement, revival almost, if you will. And, you know, if we think about the pilgrims and the Puritans in the 1600s, I can think that Many of them are, are, you know, that you, you need to make have control of your emotions, right? The thing with the Great Awakening that's different is that there's actually much more of a spirit of um, enthusiasm, of joy, of um, explain things like, you know, hellfire and brimstone, you know, starts being really preached here, uh, really getting people to have an emotional reaction and to, you know, experience God throughout the five senses, right? Uh, and so when we read Jonathan Edwards' uh, sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, we're actually going to see him, and we'll talk about him a little bit more, about him actually almost having a sensual experience with religion, right? Uh, we'll get into that a little bit when we get to him. Not everyone was as maybe extreme as Jonathan Edwards was, but again, there's this things about really feeling it, right? Um. Imperial politics, again, we're getting closer and closer to the revolution, right? Um, we see the uh, French, and Amer French and Indian War, um, you know, where um, Great Britain has gone to war with France in the colonies to, you know, claim its stake. We see native tribes kind of split. Some support America, some support uh, France. And, you know, when... Britain wins that war, you see those tribes that supported France really kind of ganged up on and, um, you know, a lot of revenge going on there, right? Um, but because this war was quite expensive and because American colonies were demanding Great Britain 
protect them on the frontier and all of that, the king raised taxes, right? And so we have things like the Stamp Act and all of that. And this is starting to really make the colonies mad. The king also, you know, spends money foolishly. He goes to war uh, with Spain and all of that. Uh, and America feels like they're having to pay his bills, and yet they don't have any representation. And so <clears throat> you're going to see some colonists kind of want to break off. You, you, it's kind of like the Pilgrims versus the Puritans all over again. You have some colonists that don't want to separate from Britain. They want to just try to reform the problem with our relationship with Great Britain um, by staying loyal, but arguing that we need representation, we need votes, we need rights. But then you have others that are much more like the pilgrims. They just want to break off relationships and start their own country, right? Um, one of the more important documents at this time is Thomas Paine's Common Sense. These are the times that try men's souls, right? Uh, that's the beginning of that one. People credit it with saving the revolution. That when George Washington and his troops were in Valley Forge, just dying and suffering under the most extreme conditions that they were reading, thank God for the printing press, they were reading Common Sense and it really kept them faithful to the movement, right? Um, we're also going to see things like the Federalist Papers. So if you're a fan of Hamilton the Musical, we're gonna read Hamilton, uh, his um, Federalist Paper this semester. We also see, uh, again, Benjamin Franklin, um, uh, Hector St. Jean de Crevecourt, who is a Frenchman who is settling here in America and writes about what it means to be an American. Uh, so again, we see this rise of this question, well, who are we? We're not really British, right? Who are we if we're not British? Um, and we're going to see at the end of the 1800s, or the 1860s, the end of the 1700s, our first, what we would call novels. Um, we're not going to read any of these. Um, and they are, you know, highly sentimental and gothic. So if you've ever read Pamela by Samuel Richardson over in England, the novels at the time are kind of along those same kind of lines, right? So pursuing happiness, um, definitely, you know, one of the continuing conflicts that we face here in America is the promise of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right? Um, and yet the reality that not everybody in this country is equal. And certainly at the time of the revolution, the only people who really had any power were wealthy white males who owned property. If you didn't own property, you couldn't vote for the most part. Um, and certainly if you were a woman, you know, we didn't get the right to vote. White women did get the right to vote to 1920. Uh, women of color didn't get the right to vote, I think into the 60s or early 70s, something like that, right? So, um, and obviously black males didn't get the right to vote until, I mean, before women did, but uh, much later, right? So we have these ideals of America, uh, of a land of opportunity, of social mobility, and yet the reality was that there were still many of the same things squashing people down here as there were in Europe. Maybe the difference is that there was so much land that if you just wanted to, you could just kind of strike out on your own and create your own world if you if you had the guts. Uh, I mean, it was dangerous, but again, there was still so much unclaimed wilderness that people could still go off by themselves and escape those things as well. Um, we're going to see more and more women start writing and uh, raising the uh, the call to end slavery and to give women uh, equal rights and equal say. Um, as we get closer to the 18, late 1800s, we're going to see um, also women taking up reform movements of all kind, reform education, reform the poorhouse, reform, you know, that kind of stuff, right? So we'll read people like Judas uh, Sergeant Murray, who uh, writes something, if you've ever read Mary Wollstonecraft's The Vindications on the Rights of Women, 
uh, Murray's piece is very similar to that. And she argues that women are rational just as much as men. And the only reason they might not look that way is because they're not given the opportunity to be educated like men are. Uh, and she makes this really great rational argument for women to be given the right to vote and that kind of stuff. Um, as we get closer to maybe 1820, 1830, um, we are going to see, again, oftentimes led by women, but sometimes led by literati, the literature, people that are writing literature, this sense that we have let down the, the ideas of the revolution, that there is a growing gap between life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, and we the people and all that, with the reality of what's going on. And so we start seeing more things written um, about wanting social reform, wanting, you know, justice, that kind of stuff, right? And if anyone is kind of the, the role model, if we will, of what it means to be American and what it means to be an enlightenment, that's gonna be Benjamin Franklin who is just one of the most amazing and fascinating characters that you'll ever read about. Um, and, and I think if you look in our book, how much is given to him, all the, the pages that he gets in our book, it kind of reflects perhaps, uh, you know, that, that he has so much to say. He was so influential. Um, and he really does embody this idea of who an American should be at this time. Um, so again, uh, I would kind of already talked about that last point. So this kind of takes us up to about 1820. When we get to 1820 and on, then we'll do another introduction uh, that you'll read. So I know this was long. You didn't have to watch it all at one go, <laughs> but uh, a lot of information to get through. And so um, hopefully this gives you a better sense of uh, what's going on and kind of the things that we're going to be looking at, uh, the genre, and the tropes, and again, this idea, of, and, I, and I have it on the syllabus. Let me bring up the syllabus here. Um, that there are some themes that I think are really interesting um, in this class. That you know we're going to kind of always be on our minds as we go here. Um, where are they? Yeah, so class themes. What is American identity, right? What is the American dream? Is it pursuit of happiness? Is it political religious freedom? Is it this idea that your status, you can, you know, create who you are? You are? Uh, coming of age and loss of innocence, right? Um, you know, we, we, we want to come of age. We want to be in control and all of that. And that's wonderful. But with that that coming of age, there is a loss of innocence. And sometimes that loss of innocence can be quite stark and eviscerating, right? So where do we see in nonfiction and fiction, you know, we see writers writing about this and what they hoped would happen, right? What they had dreamed of now that they have experience and they are now dealing with it. Sometimes they have to realize that those dreams were out of reach or they might be quite disappointed or sometimes they're like always saying, well, okay, this, this is what we've got. Well, how can we make it better? Right? The individual versus the, the group or the community. Uh, so individual versus group, uh, community welfare and freedom, right? This is another tension that we see in America where it's like, when did the rights of the individual um, over, Whelm the rights of the community or the group? And when does the right of the group more dominate the rights of the individual? And then disobedience, both civil and religious. We're going to see this theme quite a lot as well. So as you're reading, um, you can think about these themes as you're doing your weekly response posts. You can certainly incorporate any of these themes as they, you know, kind of become relevant to whatever reading that you're doing, right? So I look forward to our next lecture video. So just keep plugging away, keep reading, and send me your questions if you have them.